This is the big one, 007. Yes, by far my most requested video of the past couple of years. The one everybody seems to have been waiting for. What is my ranking of every Bond film already? If you've seen my in-depth recapping 007 reviews, you'll be pretty aware of my general feelings towards every film as I went over them all, scene by scene, in great detail. And I'm currently even remaking the early episodes from scratch as there was even more detail and opinions that I wanted to share. So if at any point during this ranking you feel I didn't elaborate enough, I kindly point you towards that playlist, because obviously for this ranking I will be summarizing my thoughts much more concisely. And because I can, I'll also include Never Say Never Again as the only non-Eon produced Bond film in this ranking, because, well, the other one would fall onto the bottom anyway. I think every Bond fan's movie ranking always changes slightly in the middle as time goes on. It's the same for me. But I use this tool that puts every Bond film against each other, resulting in a pretty accurate presentation of your ranking, to make sure my list felt as up to date as I feel about these movies today. You can find a link to this website in the description if you want to try for your own ranking yourself. Another thing I did to make this personal ranking completely valid is I went by a highly scientific method called watching them over and over again. Most of all, since a ranking is obviously subjective, I weighed in my enjoyment of each film as one of the most important factors. So, without delaying this any further, this is my ranking of every Bond film. I never made it a secret that Diamonds Are Forever is my least favorite Bond film despite it starring my favorite Bond actor in Sean Connery, who does get some fun moments in there. I tend to notice little things like that, whether a girl is a blonde or a brunette. And which do you prefer? Oh, providing the collars and cuffs match. But there is just so much in there that I either cringe at, or dislike, or find plainly stupid. Out of all the silly Bond films, this to me is the one that just doesn't hit that silliness home in an engaging or fun way. If you like Bond making out with himself, tacky B-movie special effects, Bond driving a moon buggy and his biggest arch nemesis dressed up in drag, then this film comes highly recommended. But for me, those are just some of the many reasons I just cannot get to like this film. And I know a large portion of the budget went to Sean Connery, but there really is no excuse to come up with these embarrassingly bad explosions and these lazy special effects when you already did boat a huge real explosion and people actually set on fire for real almost a decade earlier with far less budget. Speaking of which, almost a decade earlier, going from the iconic, menacing, faceless supervillain stroking his white cat to this, to me, is just plain offensive. To top it all off, I think Diamonds had the potential to be an epic follow-up to Majesties, with Bond taking revenge for the killing of his wife the film before. But no, let's just put Blofeld in a dress and have him shoot lasers from space. To me, the worst and most disappointing entry in the series, solidifying Diamonds Are Forever at the absolute bottom for me. Yes, I take the unofficial, non-Eon produced Bond film over Diamonds Are Forever. I think only in its soundtrack does Diamonds beat Never Say Never Again to me, but that's about it. And again, it stars my favorite Bond actor in a very poor remake of Fundable. I think Connery was okay in this, his performance wasn't as bored as he seemed to be in Diamonds. The problems with this film lay much more in its production value. It's quite the boring Bond film, and I'm sure people outside of Eon Productions could potentially create a fantastic Bond film too, but so far it definitely hasn't been proven despite having an original Fleming story, the original James Bond, 
a decent cast, at least on paper, and the director of arguably the best Star Wars movie in Irvin Kershner. I still can't believe these two films were made by the same guy. The one redeeming factor this film has to me is Barbara Carrara as Fatima Blush. She is one of the most memorable, over-the-top henchwomen despite not even being part of the official series. Definitely not overshadowed by Viona Volpe in the original film. And though Eon will never admit it, I think an inspiration to Xenia on the top. But even her terrific eccentric performance can save this film from its mediocre filmmaking, bad soundtrack and awful effects. To me, Quantum of Solace was definitely one of the worst Bond films in the franchise and obviously it wasn't helped being produced during the 2008 writer's strike which evidently hurt the film. It's the one Bond film that just feels confusing in its storytelling. It doesn't even seem to be sure itself what story it wants to tell. Throw in the worst shaky cam editing the series ever saw, with shots often lasting no longer than 3 seconds, and the result was one of the most disorienting and disappointing Bond films we got in modern times. It's a real pity because, much like Diamonds Are Forever, it followed the death of a prominent Bond girl the film before, and while Quantum did end up becoming a sequel, it really didn't do that much with the whole Vesper storyline. Instead, it took all kinds of convoluted detours concerning oil and water and some Bolivian general, and it just keeps on raising confusion. It's a real shame because, again, I think the film had huge potential and wanted to be so much more meaningful and enjoyable than I feel it was. Notoriously ranked at the bottom of most Bond fans' lists is Die Another Day, the one film we all seem to make fun of. It's probably no coincidence that my Die Another Day review is my most watched episode. I'll give it an however though. The first half of the film is pretty decent. Everything leading up to the clinic in Cuba is not that bad. I will actually go as far as saying the film started off extremely promising with huge potential. The second half from Iceland onwards just feels like a completely different film where everything is rammed up to the max and all logic is thrown out of the window. He starts off captured and being tortured for 14 months in North Korea. Bond is human and the stakes feel higher than ever. We never saw Bond quite like this before. Then in the second half he's driving an invisible car in the snow where he leaves tire tracks and he's dodging solar lasers from space while kite surfing a tsunami. What makes me put this over quantum though is the film at the very least is extremely memorable and where quantum doesn't go as overboard as Die Another Day does, that film just feels boring and numb. And as crazy and stupid as Die Another Day's storyline goes, I can at least follow it even when it becomes terrible in the second half. It's not necessarily boring, disappointing, completely ridiculous, over the top, but not boring. The fencing fight with Gustav Graves is great. The car chase on ice is action packed and simply awesome. It does feel like a James Bond movie. <laughs> Probably a Bond film you won't see ranked near the bottom that often, generally seen as one of Roger's best ones. But to me, his first was his weakest. Roger was great in his performance, it's nothing on him. He made a fantastic debut and proved with this film that there was life after Sean Connery. But I just don't find the film he's starring in particularly engaging. The early 70s is just that awkward period for the franchise where everything needed to be tacky and constantly in your face. Obviously I love humor but I'm just not a fan of the slapstick type of humor seen mostly in this period. 
Sheriff J.W. Pepper just sticks around for such a long time in this film. And the gags with him just go on and on and it's just not funny to me. I think Solitaire is a great Bond girl, the ultimate fantasy in a way. A mystical virgin turned into a nympho after her first sexual experience. It's the time before we leave for lesson number three. Absolutely. There's no sense in going off half cocked. And Kananga is a decent villain too. As a matter of fact, the whole cast is pretty iconic. But to me, again, it's those moments. Why do the gags always have to inflate and then blow up in your face? What were they thinking when they made Kananga go all Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Also, I'm just not the biggest fan of the whole voodoo theme of the film. Baron Samity dying and being brought back to life and showing up on that train for whatever reason in the end. I know it's loved by many, but it's just not my cup of tea. And now we've reached the most controversial pick in my ranking. Honor Majesty's Secret Service has always been that one Bond film I just wish I enjoyed more than I do. I want to love this film. Let me say up front, I am perfectly aware that this Bond film is often ranked at the top of other fans' lists. It grew to be very beloved over the years, sometimes even seen as the very best one. I can't understand it, it's a very unique Bond film, the only one in which Bond gets married. It's more emotional, it has the unique ending, the cinematography is excellent, and that soundtrack. It's all true, but for me, one of the factors I can't seem to get over is George Lazenby's portrayal of Bond. Let me make it clear, I love, no, absolutely adore the man Lazenby himself. His life story of how he became Bond is immensely inspiring and I identify with his outlook of life and his honesty, never afraid to speak his mind. But I just happen to not like his portrayal of Bond. Not to pick on him, he wasn't an actor after all, but that kind of shows in some moments. He's very wooden. It also doesn't help that for a large portion of the film, when he's Hilary Bray, he's dubbed and suddenly has a completely different voice. That never happened to the other fellas. And it just always takes me out of the movie. And the second act is very slow in its pacing. It becomes a chore to watch. Diana Rigg is one of the best Bond girls the series ever saw though. Very strong but also soft and feminine in the right moments. It's easy to see Bond would fall for her. She kind of carries the movie, so it's a real absence throughout that second act. I always maintain, and this is probably another controversial opinion, that had Connery starred in this film, it would have totally lifted the experience up for me. I did a whole video on why I believe that. Yes, even the falling in love part, People claim Connery is too cold, he never fully fell in love with any of the girls in his films. But that's just the point, the fact we didn't see him fully fall in love with any of the Bond girls in the five films before this would totally bring home the emotional aspect of seeing his Bond finally finding a woman who does steal his heart. People say Connery can't do that, but they forget he is an actor that always wanted to portray a more character-driven Bond. Though Lazenby did his absolute best, I sometimes just miss that little spark of believability and I'm taken out of the movie a bit too often. Believe it or not though, I enjoyed this movie more the last time I watched it. It even went up in my ranking, just not as far up in my list as I'm hoping it would get one day. Roger Moore's final Bond film is a decent swan song. It features my favorite Bond title song in the entire series, fantastic locations and probably some of the best villains of his tenure. Christopher Walken and Grace Jones as Max Zorin and Mayday are incredibly iconic and memorable. I love this villain duo and they completely carry this film for me. That exit of Mayday giving Zorin the finger as he blows herself up after being betrayed by him, thwarting his plans, it's so good. But it also features, to me, the weakest Bond girl of all. Jane! Help me! Jane! 
people point to Denise Richards, but to me, she is worse. And who has a freaking Zeppelin sneak up on them and not notice? Also, Roger's age. The only one in which it kind of becomes a thing for me. Probably because of the facelift. He just looks off and it becomes harder to believe all these young women would still fall for this senior agent. All his stunt doubles are so noticeable in this film too. I love Roger and he never gave a bad performance in any of his seven films. And I like this film too. But it's the villains who make this one memorable. The Man with the Golden Gun is a film I honestly really enjoy. Much like A Few to a Kill, it's the villains who are just incredible. I mean, Christopher Lee. The only guy to be a villain in The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars and Bond. Some people say they find this film too small in scale, a step down from Live and Let Die. But I honestly love the simple premise, world's greatest assassin versus Britain's finest secret agent. The Golden Gun is the weapon I wanted as a kid, put together by everyday objects. And his island too, it's such a great and Bondian villain lair. I also always liked Nick Knack as a very unique henchman and even Sheriff J.W. Pepper I find a lot funnier here than he was in Live and Let Die, despite being much more out of place in Thailand out of all places. The corkscrew stunt is impressive and I still find it such a sin that they put that slide whistle over it. Roger was pretty fun in it too. Today it's probably frowned upon when he gets into that situation where he needs to juggle the Bond girls, hides one under the sheet, sleeps with the other while he puts the one in the closet. Forgive me darling, your turn will come, I promise. But to me it's, uh, it's Roger, it's fun, it's different times. I can still totally appreciate the comedy of this situation. The Man with the Golden Gun is not groundbreaking, but it's also not nearly as terrible as some fans make it out to be. And that brings us to where I currently rank the latest Bond film as of the making of this video. No Time to Die did a lot of things I enjoy in Bond. One of the best pre-title sequences yet, that emotional throwback to Vesper. The DB5 spitting around with those Gatling guns, that heartfelt separating moment between Bond and Madeline. Bringing back a main Bond girl is even something I was hoping for years. And then you have Paloma, starring in probably the most fun sequence in the entire film. Haven't seen a Bond fan yet hating on her, but then there is also a lot of stuff in there I just can't get over. The character of Nobi being given that 007 title. It just feels so politically charged. Oh look, a strong woman of color hating on Bond is now the new 007. It doesn't even go anywhere interesting. I find her character unstandable and I dislike those forced moments to please social justice of today instead of Bond fans. Even when she gives back the 007 title, she doesn't become a new 00 either. That's how meaningless it was within the world of the film, because it was clearly meant for the outside world as a statement. And then of course you have the biggest sin, the worst thing they could have possibly done, killing off Bond, for a stupid reason too. It just leaves such a bitter aftertaste that you would forget all the unique things this film did do. Killing Felix Leiter, Blofeld gets killed, Bond gets a daughter, all kinds of things never done before in any of the past films, but all those moments are dwarfed by Bond being killed. And that moment is so dominant, that's the one thing you're gonna remember this film for. It is well directed, it looks fantastic, Craig is good in it, the music is great, there is stuff to like in there, preventing it from becoming the worst one for me. But the writing just took so much elements exactly polar opposite of Bond fans' wish lists. After the incredibly long wait for this film, for them to end up doing exactly what we were afraid they were going to do, it just feels like such a gut punch to us fans. 
Spectre is a film most Bond fans would probably say I overrate. It's not a particularly liked Bond film and I think that mostly has to do with the fact that in Craig's timeline they made Blofeld Bond's foster brother and that just feels like Austin Powers territory. I can't disagree, however to me Where No Time To Die missed the entire wish list of Bond fans and brought so much stuff we didn't want. This one definitely feels like a fan pleasing love letter. It feels like the first proper blueprint Bond in Craig's tenure. You have the larger than life Spectre room, the first time we get a proper memorable henchman in Craig's films, a great Bondian car chase through the streets of Rome, which I seriously don't understand any critique for, Bond in a white dinner jacket, a fantastic fight in the train, a classic Fleming-esque torture sequence and honestly a fantastic pre-title sequence. While I obviously respect everyone's opinion, I cannot see how anyone would rate this below Quantum of Solace. You can follow this story, the cinematography is beautiful and the shots last longer than 3 seconds. Sure the brother thing is stupid, but certainly to me not enough to give this film as much hate as it gets. Thunderball is a Bond film that went down in my ranking throughout the years. On the one hand it is classic 60s Bond mania at its peak, the first film in the series that really went with a widescreen big budget blockbuster. On the other hand the film does suffer from pacing issues. The underwater scenes while gorgeous tend to drag and there are a lot of them. I even heard so much footage for this film ended up on the cutting room floor, but still the film feels slow in places. There is a lot to like in it too. Connery is still in top form, delivering probably his most funny performance in this film. So, what sharp little eyes you've got. Wait till you get to my teeth. Also, I seriously think this film has the most attractive lineup of Bond girls. I mean, Domino, Viona Volpe, Patricia, even Paula. And did I mention Domino is really hot? I also like the story, truly making it feel like the first Bond film where the whole world is in danger and only one man can stop it. You get the Spectre headquarters, villains throwing their goons to the sharks after they failed, Bond being badass, one-upping the villains, getting the girls, simply looking the business. It is definitely classic Bond and I always love the exotic Bahama setting, it makes you want to go on vacation. It just happens to feel like a bit of a slow Bond film. We know from the start who took the nukes, we're shown in great detail how they do it, there is nothing left for us to wonder about, so we're just spending the majority of the film waiting for Bond to reach that same point and catch up with us. His journey there is entertaining, but it can just feel a bit jarring in some places. Moonraker is a film I really enjoyed as a kid, with it being the first Bond film I have active memories of watching, together with my father when it happened to be on TV somewhere in the 90s. I don't really remember how old I was at the time, but I do remember already being fascinated by the silhouetted half-naked women in the pre-title sequence, so I'd say I was pushing 9. I remember vividly my dad explaining to me how Bond was moving his body forward to glide faster in his freefall, laughing out loud when Moneypenny was not believing he fell out of a plane without a parachute, and my father explaining how heavy Bond got in the centrifuge scene. At the time I felt I was totally watching adult stuff here. In retrospect of course, I happen to have probably watched the most child friendly of all Bond films here. I know in my recapping 007 episode I gave the silliness a lot of slag because yes, it is totally ridiculous for a secret agent to ride a hovercraft gondola through Venice and fly to outer space. It's one of those Bond films I ranked highly as a kid, then ranked near the bottom as I was getting older and learned to appreciate again to put in the middle for the sake of nostalgia today, because admittedly that just plays a part with Moonraker for me. 
Much like in Die Another Day, it may go completely overboard, but there is also a lot to praise for its production value. You can tell the money went to the screen, that gorgeous cinematography, the beautiful Can Adam film sets that just pop up one after the other. And of course, as a major fan of Thunderbirds, you also got to appreciate the fantastic model and miniature work of Derek Maddox and his brilliant special effects. It's a silly Bond film, it's totally camp, in my review I definitely pointed out all that is wrong with it, but I just cannot come to hate or dislike Moonraker. It's a nostalgic classic. <laughs> I've always liked Octopussy. It's great entertainment that has the perfect balance between having an engaging, serious Cold War threat for the plot, while at the same time being a film that is not really taking itself too serious. But then again, neither is Roger Moore. It's one of those films that simply invites you to have fun and enjoy it for what it is. The tone of the film simply works. Only Roger could pull off sneaking onto an island exclusively inhabited by women in a crocodile sub and still look cool. I mean, the guy's in a gorilla suit and a clown suit and it's still a good Bond film. I challenge you to think of any other Bond actor who could pull that one off. You see, that type of stuff could have easily fallen into tacky Diamonds Are Forever territory. But they chose to execute it in a serious and tense sequence where Bond needs to defuse a nuclear bomb and they achieved putting you on the edge of your seat with it. Also, I love the action-packed pre-title sequence with the Acrostar reeking back to Goldfinger as a fun mini-adventure unrelated to the rest of the plot. On a personal level, I also really like that Bond gets to drive an Alfa Romeo in this film. Also, a moment that never fails to put a smile on my face is Bond flipping off Kamal Khan by using his own rigged dices against him. Double sixes. Fancy that. It's all in the wrist. Man, I love that scene. The villains are great. Maude Adams returning to the franchise now as the leading lady works well and she probably had the best chemistry with Roger out of all of his Bond girls. I do maintain though, the Tarzan yell, it shouldn't have been in there. At least it's brief, but I can't help but cringe every time that part comes up. That doesn't take away from the fact that it's an entertaining watch, one I always seem to have ranked in the middle of the pack, and that hasn't really changed. Dr. No is one of those Bond films I learned to appreciate more as I got older. It really is a terrific start and introduction to the cinematic Bond and Sean Connery to me solidified himself as the best man to ever portray Bond. To me, he was James Bond, straight from his debut. He is the reason to watch this film and I would argue he is definitely one of the reasons the 007 franchise became a success to begin with. The man just electrifies the screen and you can totally imagine how groundbreaking all of this must have been back in 62. Take the sequence at Miss Tarot's house for example. Bond knows she's a villain. He cheats death. He shows up for his date with her anyway. The way he portrays both that dangerous yet charming side. He totally sells it and it tells you everything you need to know about the character of James Bond. To me, this scene should be one of the mandatory audition scenes for any future Bond actor. Imagine in the 60s, all of a sudden, here you had a supposed hero who would sleep with the girl on the villain's side, have her be arrested after using her for sex, and set out a trap for the killer sent out to get him. And when he does, he simply kills him too, smoking a cigarette, looking to business. To me, this movie is not vanilla. This is still what makes Bond such a fantasy and what made guys like me still talk about this film over 60 years later. And I mostly even was just talking about that one scene. I haven't even mentioned Ursula Andress. If every woman wants to be with Bond and every man simply wants to be him, then I think every girl wanted to be like Honey Rider and every man wanted to be with her. Despite her rather simple role, no one can deny when thinking of the term 
Bond girl, she comes to mind as the most iconic one. I also love how the villain isn't shown until the third act of the film, yet his presence is felt throughout and there is the whole mystery vibe surrounding the film. It's such a classic. When I was younger and mostly was just looking for action scenes, obviously Dr. No falls short. But it offers great intrigue and characters. I only wish the soundtrack was better for the film. But overall, had Dr. No not been such a success, I probably wouldn't have had this YouTube channel to begin with. It's a film I grew to have tremendous respect for. Roger Moore has the reputation of being the funny, light-hearted Bond, but I am so glad that For Your Eyes Only also exists. The serious Roger Moore feel, and in my opinion, his second best. The franchise has had a few of those more serious down-to-earth spy thrillers, and this is like Roger's from Russia with Love, in a way. Instead of the lector, we just have the ATAC this time. Melina is a great change of face for a Bond girl, not being the usual right-hand secret agent that Roger got to deal with in the three films preceding this. But instead, she's an innocent girl set out for revenge for the killing of her parents. You know how in Quantum of Solace, Camille was also out for revenge, but it just felt like an unengaging, shoehorned in extra side story? Here, it totally fits the film. She's definitely one of the overlooked Bond girls. The villains, however, aren't. To me, the weak link of the film. I know Julian Glover was in Star Wars and Indiana Jones, but he's just not really engaging or memorable as a Bond villain. There's nothing really that makes him stand out. Neither do any of his henchmen. I appreciate that they literally brought the film back to Earth after Moonraker, and I love that Roger put in a more serious performance. They stripped away his gadgets and made him rely on his own skill and wits, with that mountain climbing climax still being a very tense sequence. I feel this film is sometimes overlooked or maybe even underrated, but definitely deserves a lot of praise. <laughs> Which brings us to the OG spy thriller of the franchise, From Russia With Love, based on one of my all-time favorite Fleming novels. Some would probably claim I ranked it too low, but honestly, it went up in my ranking tremendously as I got older. Is it top 5 material like most Bond fans would claim? Objectively, maybe, yeah. I would say the novel, most definitely. But like I mentioned in my revised recap of this film, one of the best novels doesn't automatically translate to one of the best films for me. There's a difference between what works on the page and what works on the screen. It is a Bond film that really was made before the Bond blueprint was perfected, so to speak. So it really feels like a proper Fleming Bond put on the screen. And you got to really respect it for that. I adore all of the scenes taking place on the Orient Express. The cast is superb, the tension is spot on, and the fight between Bond and Red Grand still holds up as one of the most raw and real fights in the entire series. Also, that gypsy fight? Nice. Much like in Fundable, we are ahead of Bond. We know more than him, but unlike Fundable, you're watching Bond walk into Spectre's trap and it's a lot more engaging and tense. I do feel, if you're not a Bond fan, that From Russia With Love is probably the least accessible film to get familiar with the franchise. It's great on its own, but every time I watch this film with newcomers, my friends or my girlfriend, they all seem to get confused by the whole premise of Smurfs and Spectre, the Bulgarians, the Russians, the Gypsies, who double crosses who, I don't mean to say From Russia With Love needed to spoon fed it more, I'm just saying it became a bit more convoluted than its simple East vs West storyline it originally was in the novel. In other words, to me, the storyline is crystal clear, but for newcomers it's not always as easy to get into. Regardless, I think this should be regarded as one of the best Fleming-esque classics that we have in the franchise. 
Compiling this ranking through the website linked in the description that I mentioned at the start, I kind of came to the revelation that being born in 1990, I am more nostalgic towards Brosnan's films than I initially thought I would be. We've reached the top 10 and Tomorrow Never Dies ended up in it. Compared to From Russia With Love, it's obviously the inferior story. In fact, I think you could describe Tomorrow Never Dies as quite generic. A retelling of The Spy Who Loved Me, which in turn was a rehash of You Only Live Twice. I guess you could say this is Brosnan's Lewis Gilbert movie that wasn't made by Lewis Gilbert. The thing is, it's generic, but it's entertaining generic. It's one of those Bond films that is just so easy to digest and enjoy. It's super action packed with the amazing pre-title sequence, the car park car chase with the fun gadget laden BMW, the rooftop bike chase handcuffed together with Wei Lin. It's super fun. It only really sinks in for me once we reach the stealth boat. The climax is just okay. Wei Lin is a Bond girl I think I would rank higher today than I initially did in my top 10 Bond girls. She's great and you gotta appreciate Michelle Yeoh's skills, truly feeling like Bond's equal in so many ways. A thing with Braston's films though, they brought in interesting ideas and they never really fully execute them. A former flame of Bond, which could have been Natalia from Goldeneye. The torture sequence with Stamper could have been chilling. And I think it's a shame that car throwing of Ricky J's Gupta ended up on the cutting room floor. Despite all that, everything it does do, it does well. With this scene probably being my favorite moment in the film. Wait, I'm just a professional doing a job. Me too. And The World Is Not Enough made the lower half of my top 10 too, I guess. I had plenty of critique to give this film in my full analysis, but honestly, it brought a lot of interesting new ideas to the series. For one, having Bond fall in love with the woman who turns out to be the main villain is genius. I think it was Barbara Broccoli who said Bond was expecting another Tracy, but came to find another Blofeld. Also, Brosnan gave his best performance in this film and got a lot more character-driven plot lines to play with. The thing with this film though, and I rank it high, but I feel it could have reached even better potential had all these interesting concepts been perfected. The idea of a villain not feeling pain is interesting, but doesn't really go deeper than him picking up a hot rock and slamming through a glass table. The same holds for Bond getting injured, though it becomes part of the plot for a little bit. Later on he's capable of swimming pretty much from the bottom of the ocean with an injured shoulder. Or what about the way in which Elektra manages to make Bond crack and fall for her when he was swearing he wouldn't do anything with her. All fantastic ideas that lack in its execution. What makes me still rank this high then? Electra King is among one of the best villains ever conceived. The pre-title sequence is one of the best and most action-packed. M gets kidnapped. Robbie Coltrane returns. There is so much still to like. Sure, you could point to Denise Richards being the weak link of the film. And you'd be pretty correct. But hey, she's very easy on the eyes. Much like For Your Eyes Only, a film I think gets massively overlooked. Definitely the guilty pleasure in my ranking. You Only Live Twice is classic prime 60s entertainment and I just eat that stuff. That hollowed out volcano has got to be the best villain lair in all of Bond. In so many ways does this film remind me of Thunderbirds. The opening sequence in space, the way the volcano lair opens up and a rocket flies out, panels full of buttons and all of that good stuff. Furthermore, they really brought Japan to life with this movie, truly feeling like a travelogue adventure where you get to soak in the culture. I also adore the music and the cinematography in this film, and the little Nelly. 
Sure, the film does have its flaws. Bond turning Japanese did not work at all. Even the film itself seems to forget about it when Bond reaches Blofeld and his hair is so completely back to normal and his chest hair is back by the climax. A lot of the plot falls thin when you really start questioning it, but damn is it entertaining. Though Connery is past his A-game by this film, I never found his performance to be dull or boring. He still does fine by my liking. For some fans, this film is a complete disaster. For me, it simply works. Where I love the over-the-top classicness of You Only Live Twice, I simultaneously love the realism of The Living Daylights. To me, this film falls into that Cold War spy thriller genre of Bond films, and in my opinion, it's the one that did that the best. Timothy Dalton is so good in this, and I am definitely among the people who feels he should have done more Bond films. I love his tense approach, portraying a serious professional. A bit moody, but you can tell he plays someone with experience. Paired up with the innocent Cara Malovi, it just works so well. I really like what Mariam Dabo did with the role, and it's refreshing to see Bond with just one leading lady this time around. The film does suffer from the same problem as For Your Eyes Only. The villains aren't really up for speed. Despite also being Dutch and sharing the same name, Jeroen Krabbe as Koskov does not convince me as a Russian general at all, and Whitaker isn't really menacing or an inspiring villain either. Necros feels generic too. It's the story and especially the intrigue of the first half combined with the chemistry between Bond and Kara, the best John Barry soundtrack, and fantastic action sequences that really made this film such a breath of fresh air to watch. We're getting into the ones I consider top tier now. The Spy Who Loved Me is by far the best Bond film of the 1970s and my favorite Roger Moore film. If someone who never saw a Bond film wanted to know what Bond is all about, I'd show this one. It ticks all the boxes. The larger than life villain with world domination plans living in an extravagant lair. The gadget laden car. Bond being cool, attractive, beautiful women, lots of action, a globe-spanning plot, a super iconic henchman, this is a James Bond film in every sense of the meaning. I only wish the filmmaker still held the rights to use Spectre by this point. I'm not even a particularly big fan of Blofeld, but Stromberg's character screams to have been a Blofeld as was originally planned. Pressing buttons to throw people to sharks, provoking war into the world, etc. It's a rehash of You Only Live Twice's plot, but the execution of Bond teaming up with a KGB agent just works so much better for this film, with Barbara Bach's Anya Omasova being such an iconic Bond girl. If For Your Eyes Only was Rogers from Russia with Love, then this was his Goldfinger. And speaking of Goldfinger, that one takes my fifth spot in my ranking for very similar reasons. You could make a very fair argument that Bond doesn't even do that much in this film, being captured near the middle all the way up to the climax, but again, this one just ticks all the boxes. Where I believe the novel from Russia with Love was superior to its movie counterpart, here I feel the movie Goldfinger is far superior and a massive improvement over the novel. Guy Hamilton managed to direct a Bond film that would forever set a template all Bond movies would be measured up to. This film is just iconic every other scene, from the super fun pre-title sequence, the shocking. The iconic Shirley Bassey title song, The Golden Girl, The DB5, Oddjob and his lethal bowler hat, The Laser Scene, Pussy Galore, The Ford Knox Raid, it just goes on and on. I heard people say this film is overrated, and though plot-wise you could make a point as it's not as complex and deep as 
from Russia with love. But again, there's a difference between what works on the page and what works on the screen. And this, cinematically, simply is a 24 karat masterpiece. And speaking of masterpieces, Skyfall definitely falls into that category for me as well. But for vastly different reasons than the previous two. Whereas I praise Goldfinger and The Spy Who Loved Me for being great formulaic Bond films, I praise Skyfall for doing something different outside of the Bond blueprint. Instead, this is just a darn good film, absolutely beautifully shot, maybe the best looking Bond film to date. And while the plot certainly gets contrived near the second half, to me it's never spoiled and remains to be super engaging until the very end. And I think Silva is a major reason it remains so entertaining. I love what Bardem did with this character. He felt very fresh, scary, yet funny, and he's not a Bond villain out to get Bond. He's out for M which in itself is a super interesting idea. The death of Judy Dench's M is very emotional, essentially a goodbye to a whole chapter of my childhood. There's no main Bond girl in this one, again steering away from the usual formula. You could say that M is essentially the Bond girl in this one. Severin, I wish she was in this film more. Her character was very mysterious and intriguing and obviously smoking hot. She went a bit too soon. What this film also does better than any other Bond film is engage the MI6 cast, perfectly setting up the new Q, the new Moneypenny and Mallory in the end taking over as the new M. Also the dialogue and humor is great, it has its iconic moments. I feel Skyfall will definitely be remembered as one of the greats as time goes on. Maybe even the greatest of all, Casino Royale, by far Craig's best Bond film. Martin Campbell rescued the franchise twice, with this following up Die Another Day. This reboot was a breath of fresh air reinventing Bond for the years to come, and sadly never reached the same heights it did from its first one. It stripped away a lot of what we thought a cinematic Bond should be, instead brought us a fantastic reimagining where Bond was brought back as the center of attention again. Craig portrayed a rookie agent slowly earning his 00 status, dealing with personal flaws, being reckless, having an ego, but slowly transforming into a modern version of the classic character we know. And that was just handled in the most perfect way. Eva Green is probably the best Bond girl character in the entire series. Mads Mikkelsen made Le Chief a great adversary and those poker scenes. Somehow Campbell succeeded in making it one of the most tense sequences in all of Bond. I would go as far as to say Casino Royale objectively is the best Bond film made so far. I just happen to have two Bond films that tick my personal boxes that little more. Perhaps a cliche to fans of my generation, but GoldenEye was my childhood favorite for the longest time and it's still a Bond film I have always regarded as one of the absolute best. First of all, Brosnan's debut. To me, this was the first time since Connery where the fantasy element of man that guy is cool, I wish I could be him, was brought back. Never did Bond look better, in the same way that Casino Royale reinvented Bond for the 2000s, Campbell did it here too, for the 90s. This film features a fantastic opening stunt, a super iconic tank chase, the best henchwoman in the entire series in Xenia Anatop. Definitely Dutch pride watching her light up the screen. And the idea of Bond going up against another 00 agent is super original. Sean Bean was casted perfectly for the part. And the same really holds for all the other characters with Natalia probably being the best Bond girl after Vesper for me. 
GoldenEye is a film I never get tired of and I can watch in every mood. I often like to call this one the Goldfinger of my generation. If you've been following my channel, you won't be surprised to know my favorite Bond film is License to Kill. Is it the most iconic one? No. Is it the best looking one? No, far from it. But it is the one I feel was written the best and featured the best Bond villain in the series. You know how people always say a film is only as good as its villain? Well, look no further than Robert Davi's Fran Sanchez. I want you to know this is nothing personal. It's purely business. I think License to Kill's uniqueness can truly be appreciated when watching these films in order. After a long period of silliness and light-hearted entertainment, here we are brought into a very raw and mature Bond film that mixes the crime genre with Bond. When a Bond villain would press a button to have his minions be fed to piranhas or sharks, there was always the cartoonish irony to it. Not here. Here's a guy who rips out someone's heart, has Felix's leg bitten off and his wife be raped. This movie is not messing around. And the fact that Bond is forced to go rogue for the first time in the series just wakes you up watching this in order. This one just hits different. Dalton is not my all-time favorite Bond actor, but he is spectacular in the part. And the way he and Pam have to single-handedly try to take down this invincible drug lord is written in such a clever way. He can't just barge into some villain lair and save the day like he usually does. Sanchez is the type of villain that could exist in real life, that has the entire country in his pocket. But Sanchez happens to value loyalty, which is the exact attribute Bond tries to use against him, making him distrust his own people to slowly take him down. Again, brilliant writing. And I'm even a passionate defender of Talisa Soto's Loopy, which to me gets flagged for bad acting way too often and is completely misunderstood to be a bubblehead. She's actually super smart, trying to make everyone believe she's just there for window dressing, but she knows what she's doing. She knows the reaction she triggers on Pam, deliberately even looking if she's watching when she's about to kiss Bond. And she knows how to use her beauty to manipulate men, Bond included. There's a lot of subtleties to her part I think go over people's heads here. Also, people claim it's too much of an 80s Miami Vice-like movie that doesn't feel like Bond. But there's also that badass water skiing escape, only James Bond could do that. Not even the villains believed he did it. The climax too, it still holds up. The way it all comes full circle with Felix's present, I can go on and on forever on why I love this Bond film so much. To me, this is not the one that executed the Bond formula the best. It's the one that steered away from the formula the best, while simultaneously still being a James Bond film. A very, very well written one. So that's it for my ranking of every Bond film. I really hope you enjoyed this long overdue massive project. I am exceptionally interested in other Bond fans' rankings and their reasoning for why a film is ranked where it is. So please leave your thoughts on my ranking as well as sharing your own rankings. Like if you enjoyed this video, subscribe if you haven't and take a look at my Patreon page if you're interested in supporting this channel. For now, see you guys again in the next video.